do you like? Take a seat. Before we continue, uh, we will have notices later with some more general news, but there is some news I heard this morning that I did want to share with you. Um, Rebecca and Mark were on their way here this morning and they were cycling. Rebecca's wheel got stuck in a tram track. She went flying over the handlebars and she's hit her head. So um, Mark and Rebecca have gone to hospital. We don't know anything else yet, but please keep them both in your prayers. And we will, of course, pray for them both during our intercessions. 
The Spirit of the Lord fills the world and knows our every word and deed. Let us then open ourselves to the Lord and confess our sins in penitence and faith. We say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring us his pardon and peace, now and forever. Amen. The prayer for today. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions, make them to ask such things as shall please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Tirza is now going to bring us our readings this morning. The first reading is taken from Romans chapter 12, the verses 1 through 8. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the gospel reading is taken from Matthew chapter 16, the verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, 
and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thank you, Tirza. Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you for the promise that your word entering into our lives brings your light. So open the eyes of our hearts that we might receive from you all that you have for us, that we might be your people who continually look to you and trust in you. Amen. Welcome once more. And uh, I want to say that uh, we are God's people. We are part of God's flock here in Amsterdam. And our other brothers and sisters around this city are gathering in Jesus' name as well. And so consciously we take on the fact that as we offer up worship to him, God promises to meet with us whatever our circumstances, even those unexpected things, just as we've heard about the situation with Rebecca, and we do entrust her to the Lord's keeping, for he is able. Well, we are looking in the the next few weeks, we're looking at the final few chapters of Romans. Now, this book of Romans, if you can imagine, is written to a set of first century Christians, people who are from other parts of the Roman Empire and some who are locals. And Paul has been writing to them about a number of things, and he raises a question for us today that we in the 21st century can apply to our lives. What do we see? Because the Bible is such an honest book, Paul holds nothing back. Here is the book of Romans in a nutshell, just quickly summarized. And this is something that Paul wants the Roman Christians and us to understand, to fully embrace what God has accomplished in Christ through the gospel, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Paul goes on to show how the good news of Jesus is for both the irreligious or the secular, Some people might say those who don't care too much about what God has to say. And also for the religious, those who are seeking to order their lives in a moral and uh, religious way. Either way, whether one is religious or irreligious, both kinds of people need to experience God's salvation. And God opens the way for anyone to be rescued and to be delivered to see that the powers of sin and death do not hold us if we belong to Christ. Paul goes on to explain further on in Romans that the Christian life is a life that is empowered by the Spirit. The Christian life is not something that God just says, do all these things but he doesn't provide the resources to do them. God is so gracious in providing all that we need that he will give us the tools. He will give us the strength. He will give us the power to do that which he calls us to because it's a process of sanctification, of God making us continually more like Jesus. He then addresses further on the challenge and the sadness that many of Paul's fellow countrymen, the Jewish people, that they have not responded to the invitation of the gospel. 
And so he writes for a, no, a couple of chapters on what God's intentions are for the people who, from whom Messiah comes. What are God's intentions and how in the long term will God work out his purposes with them? And the fact is there is hope for all people. And in these final chapters, chapters 12 through 16 that we're looking at starting today, is that Paul is bringing before us the implications. What does it mean that we have this salvation? How does this affect our daily lives? So in the next few weeks, we're going to grapple with this. And we're looking at the first eight verses of chapter 12 of Romans today. And uh, I'll try to remind you of what that says. Normally, we would have a copy of the scriptures right there in front of you. But because of these times we're in, we're not going to do that today. But I'll try to remind you of what the, what the words are. What does it look like when we are a cross-shaped community of followers of Jesus? There's a word that some might use of this cruciform. To be shaped by the cross of Christ. As a community of the King, what does that look like? We have our questions and our fears. We don't know what one day will bring. We know that often we fail to measure up. We, fail, we feel continually a sense of burden or disappointment that things have not gone as we would have hoped. Sometimes our walk or our manner of life, the way that we live, does not match what we say or what we profess. And we know that that is not the way God calls us to live. So, what do we do about that when we feel that we have not managed to live in the way that God has called us to as his people? Well, Paul has a lot of good things to say to us that will help us with that. And so in the next few minutes, I hope that you'll hear some words of encouragement and hope. Because something has happened that changes everything. And we need to take this something, this event, into, into account. Because what you're going to hear today, hopefully, has nothing to do with my adding to your burden more things to do so that God will love you. Another list of requirements, another thing, list of things to do to avoid spiritual thin ice. In the sense of being more religious, more pious? No, because we know that God already loves each of you so much that he makes a way so that you and I can advance, can, can go forward, can receive hope and encouragement by the gospel. That's why when Paul begins this chapter, he says, Therefore, Therefore, by the mercies of God. Now, when he says, therefore, someone has said, you need to look at what he, that word is there for. So he's looking back at the entire chapters of Romans from 1 through 11 that have preceded this up to chapter 12. So he's saying, based upon the mercies of God. Now, in the immediate verses that in, as, as chapter 11 ends, this is how Paul uh, expresses praise to God in doxology, praise and giving glory to God. He says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So Paul, ending chapter 11 on this this note of praise, giving glory to God for all of the things that he has provided in saving us through Jesus Christ. He's reminding the Roman Christians, and he's reminding us, 
that God has shown how the free gift of God's grace through Christ has addressed a big problem that we have. Because as we know earlier on in Romans, we're told that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So Paul is giving glory to God in this doxology, but he's also saying we fall short of God's glory. So what, what, is, the, what is the answer? Well, the answer is that Jesus himself makes a way for us to come into God's presence, to be rectified, that is to be set upright before God, to be able to stand before him with the same kind of holiness, the same kind of righteousness that Jesus has. Why is that? Not because we're perfect, not because we are acceptable, not because we have it all sorted out, but because we have exchanged our sin for the righteousness, the perfect record of Jesus Christ. And so now when God looks upon us in Christ, there is no condemnation. There is nothing against us because Jesus took that upon himself and gave us his perfect righteousness. Now we are a new creation. Now we have a new power. Now we have within us the Holy Spirit who gives us what we need. And so we are a new people. That's why we can say we are a cross-formed community. So Paul, when he says, therefore, in verse 1 of chapter 12, it's pretty consequential. And he calls us to three things. Sacrificial living, selflessness, living in one body together, the body of Christ. Sacrificial living. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So based upon all that he has already said in the book of Romans, because of that, he says, the logical conclusion is to put yourselves all in on the altar as a living sacrifice to God. This is self-sacrifice. You could call this absolute surrender to God. And brothers and sisters, do you see the connection? Do you see that it's not just one part of your life that belongs to God? It's all, all of life. We, all of us, our bodies, everything about us belongs to God. And we should not try to compartmentalize, set this part of, this, this day apart, or this time, or this this project apart for God, everything belongs to him, all of us. Now we're called to live a life of self-sacrifice. But what does that mean? Does that feel like a heavy burden? Well, I hope not, because as uh, the Heidelberg Catechism says, the first question that asks this question, what is your only comfort in life and in death? I love this. The answer, that I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by the Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. So when God calls us to lay ourselves on the altar, he also gives us something within us that desires to follow him, to make ourselves available to him. And as we live this self-sacrificial life, though, we're called to something else. We're called to a form of, of resistance. 
He says in verse 2, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. So two commands here in this verse. They're imperatives, but they're in the passive voice. He says, don't be conformed. And uh, one translation by J.B. Phillips says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. So don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be being transformed. He's not saying there's something that you and I can do to make this transformation happen. Just understand that he is already at work to make us like Jesus. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Do you know do you know that God delights in you? Do you understand that he loves you? Not based on your performance. Not based upon all the good things you've done. No. It's based upon his sheer, the sheer fact that you were made by him for his glory. And he wants his love to be poured out on you. I know some of you have, are parents, and you have experienced this. You have delighted in your child as you've seen that child take his or her first steps. Or you have experienced that as a child, or you've seen other parents looking after their children in a way that they delight in that child. So, that, so much so that you can see the love that that parent has for the child. Do you know that your heavenly father has this kind of love and more for you? If we see this, it helps us in the renewing of our minds as we live a self-sacrificial life, laying our lives on the altar totally for him. We see that our father delights in us and we want to please him. A child delights in the opportunity to take that first step and to see the joy that comes across the mother's face as that step is taken. God has this same kind of joy in us. So as we are transformed, our minds are renewed. Our thoughts mattered. Nonconformity to the world means that our lives, our minds will be affected. Paul says in verse 3, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. We have two tendencies. Some, some of us, and sometimes the same person at different times, we think too highly of ourselves. We put ourselves at the center of everything. And if something doesn't go right with us, we're not happy. And we think everyone else should kind of march to our tune. But some of us, some of you struggle with this, and I have too. We think of ourselves in a way that is not in accordance with the way God made us, in a way that is too lowly, and we almost despise ourselves. We don't take joy in the fact that God made each one of us uniquely to reflect his glory. There's only one person who can be you. No one else. And so as we lay ourselves on the altar and totally offer ourselves to the Father as a living sacrifice, something begins to happen and the Holy Spirit working in us 
begins to activate the unique gifting that he has given to each one of us. And so our life in the community is reflected in the way that we love one another in the one body by using the gifts that we have. We are in one body with many different members. It's like Paul uses this figure, the human body. If, if one part of it, as he says in 1 Corinthians 12, if one part of it is injured, the rest of the body knows it. We are all affected by when something happens, even today, when we heard this difficult news to hear about Rebecca being injured. We know that all of these things affect us. And each one of the things that God has given us, each gifting that God has given us, he intends for us to use so that we can build up one another and we can call one another to follow Christ more faithfully. Now, I'm not going to go through this list of gifts in detail, but I encourage you to look at it when you have some time. Verses 4 through 8. And each of these gifts are very similar to other gifts that are listed in other parts of the New Testament. Now, this gift in Romans 12, someone has pointed out, it's like the Father has given these gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, the Son has given the gifts that are listed there. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're told by Paul that the Holy Spirit has given those gifts to the to the church in Ephesians 4. The point is that all of these gifts are given for the building up of the body of Christ. And it is in the context of a community of faith as we live together and serve together and care for one another that others will see the gifts that God has given various ones of us. It's not necessarily up for you, up to you or to me to decide which gift I have or you have. It's for others to help speak into that as they can. So I just want to encourage you to follow Christ wholeheartedly. To be people who are self-sacrificing, fully offering up the, their lives to the Lord. And then serving together selfishly, selflessly in one body. Just close today with a story that's taken from a book by Philip Yancey called Reaching for the Invisible God. He mentions that there was a man named Edward Langerak, a philosophy professor at a college in Minnesota in USA. He said this in a chapel address. I once knew a little boy when he was seven years old. This boy made a mistake that left a deep impression on him. He walked into a drugstore, a chemist, and tried to steal some penny candy. He was unsuccessful, but instead of being reported to the police, he was made to go home and tell his parents what he had done. The task was most difficult. It was the most difficult he had ever faced. He had fleeting thoughts of breaking his arm on purpose, of running in front of a car, or of doing anything that would relieve him of the dreadful conversation with his parents. But the conversation took place. The little boy's father had one immediate reaction. My son is a criminal. Those words cut to the heart. They were terrible, but they were true. Seven years old. A criminal. But the boy's weeping mother took only a few seconds to respond to that verdict. My son is not a criminal. He's going to be a preacher. Langerak continues, I was that boy, and my mother's response was a lesson in love. My father loved me too, loved me enough to say what was true. I had done something that in that moment defined me as a thief. But he did not say the whole truth. My mother saw the possibility in me, saw what I could do, and not just what I had done, 
Now, it turns out, both of them were wrong. I became neither a preacher nor a criminal, but a professor. But the way that my mother loved me then taught me much about how to love myself. Suppose there were a person who always saw the possibilities in you and who always forgave you for what you are and who constantly sympathetically challenged you to become what you should be. And suppose that person is not just anyone, but is a person to whom you and everyone else is ultimately responsible. Would not such a person enable you to discover the power of love, to realize the truth of the claim that only the loved can love? Would not such a person be loved in your love for yourself and for others? If so, then in devotion to that person, you would love yourself and your neighbor as you love yourself. And you, and that would be something truly awesome. You see, God, having set his love upon you and me, when he calls us to live in a certain way, he calls us from love. He calls us as he sees your potential and mine as you offer yourselves up to him, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable in your service of worship. O oh Lord, bring these thoughts to us in a new and fresh way that our lives will be transformed by the power of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray this. Amen. Thank you, Kerry, for those powerful words. Let's stand. Let's declare our faith in our living God. We say together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please do take a seat. We come now to our time of prayer where we will be praying for the world at large, but also concerns closer to home. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, Lord of the Church, thank you that we are free to meet together today, whether in person or online. We pray for you, your people in countries who risk persecution. Please encourage and protect them. We pray for Kerry and Cynthia, Alan and Natalie, and Ben and Cynthia. Please fill them with your Holy Spirit as they lead your church in Amsterdam. Please bless the leadership teams and the council as they look to the way forward to all the churches being open and our plans for mission and outreach in the community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of power, sometimes it feels as if the world is out of control. Please help us to remember that you hold the world in the palm of your hand. Please let us never forget that you are always in control and the final battle is already won. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of creation, thank you for the world you have given us. Please help us to use the resources you have given us wisely. Please send relief and comfort to the people affected by extreme climate conditions. And please help the experts and specialists who are trying to fight COVID-19. Please bring an end to this horrible virus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of healing, we pray for the people we know who are sick in mind, body, or spirit. And Lord, this morning we especially pray for Rebecca after her accident this morning. We ask you to heal her of her injuries. We ask you to bless the medical staff working with her. We ask you to bless Mark and the family who are obviously worried and must be in shock. Please bless them all and put your loving arms around them and let them feel you close to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of our land, we pray for the leaders of our government and our cities. Please give them wisdom and compassion. In this time of silence, we pray for the countries that are close to our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of our lives, we thank you that you have promised never to leave us or forsake us. We ask you to bless us this week and help us to walk closely with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we say together, merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have a few notices, but to be honest, if you've been to services recently, the notices probably aren't very different from last week, and they probably won't be very different next week. We do need more help, especially now that we are having physical services as well as Zoom services in all three locations. We're very happy that all three congregations are now having physical services. But that does mean we need more help. For City Centre, if you can help, please speak to Ivan or Jasper or basically anyone um, if, and offer your help. Morning prayer and night prayer are continuing at nine o'clock in the morning and nine o'clock in the evening, Monday to Friday. Please do let the leadership team know of any needs. 
Please don't sit there in silence worrying that you can't buy food, worrying that you can't put food on the table, worrying that you can't pay your mortgage or your rent. There is help available. If you have been hit financially by COVID, if you have lost your job, if you've been laid off for whatever reason, please do speak to us. We do have a hardship fund to help anyone who's in dire straits because of COVID or for any other reason. As we've said this morning, we are a family and if one of us hurts, all of us hurt. So please don't suffer in silence. Let us know. Kids Church um, is starting again today, um, 11.30 on Zoom um, with Ez and Ada will be Kids Church. And that happens on the second or fourth Sundays of the month. The youth group is starting again on the 6th of September on Zoom, and that happens on the first and third Sundays of the month. And we want to thank you again for your ongoing support. We can't be a church without financial support. So thank you for everyone who does give regularly. If you don't yet give regularly, and it's something that you would like to do, um, here are our bank details. Um, if you don't want to use online banking, there should be a basket at the back if you want to give any cash donations. And the bank details will stay up during um, the next hymn. But please feel free to take a photo of this. No one will mind. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. I don't know what sign you want to offer because you can't shake hands, you can't hug, but maybe you can wave at each other. <laughs> Please stand to hum for our next hymn. All praise to him, the God of light, who formed the mountains by his might. Thank you. 
Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord is here. The Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night before, on the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, Taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, Send your Holy Spirit on this bread and this wine that it may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. As our Savior taught us, we pray, each in our own language, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in the one bread. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to come forward to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've, pre we've prepared it in a way that's a bit different than usual, but what will be possible is that I will stand here toward the front and row by row, Jasper will show you when to come, and you can just take a piece of bread that already has the consecrated wine on, on each piece, you can take that for yourself. And uh, as, you, as you come forward, just exit through the office and then come back around for the rest of the service, which will end shortly. But uh, let me just say these words, because as we partake of the body and blood of Christ, we are reminded that the Holy Spirit comes and meets with us in a way that shows us that Christ is with us as we partake of this meal. So brothers and sisters, I invite you to come one by one. I'll, I'll begin, uh, I'll just uh, partake and then, then I'll ask you to join. and blood of Christ, which he gave for you. This is the body and blood of Christ, which he gave for you. The bread of heaven, the cup of salvation. The body and blood of Christ, which he gave for you. the body and blood of Christ, which he gave for you. The body and blood of Christ.
Marching out 